last time we spoke was in your office at the UND locker room. And I was on this tour and I got um, separated from everybody else on the tour. I got lost and there was no cell reception. And I ended up winding my way like out of the locker room. And finally, like, I, I couldn't even tell you how I did it. I, but I ended up on the concourse at some point and ran into everybody like 45 minutes later. First time I've been lost in a, in a hockey locker room. Is this a, is this a common occurrence at the UND facility? Cause it's, well, um, it's, it, it's a typical, typical lower level, uh, facility as far as it, it's a, it's a big circle, big sphere going around, but there are a couple hallways you need to turn on. Uh, and then there are all, there are a couple doors that you need to have uh, pass codes in order to get into the, the, the hockey area. So, um, you know what? I take that back. Now that remodeled the weight room, uh, yeah, you can't make it all the way around, can you? So did you go up by the Zamboni uh, hole? Is that where you got upstairs? I, I was I was down by the by like the kitchen, like not your kitchen, but the the, the facility kitchen, and somehow I, I went up a flight of stairs and and made my way to the the main. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I should next time I'll bring some breadcrumbs with me. But I'm just curious, what what's the square footage of the facility? Like just the hockey oh. portion of the facility. Wow, I, I have no idea. Let me think. The weight room is about fourteen thousand square feet. So, oh my god, I would guess thirty five thousand square feet. I would guess maybe a little more than that. Now with the recovery room, maybe closer to forty. I, I you know what? I'm not even certain on that. It's it, like I got to think that there's some Amazon fulfillment centers that aren't as large as the footprint, but you guys have there. <laughs> um, I, I'd just be curious, like. You have this opportunity, and I understand that I think it was either during COVID or coming out of COVID that you had an opportunity to remodel, maybe not the entire locker room, but but the gym specifically or the training side of it specifically. I mean, we all have our own, you know, industries and, you know, our maybe some fantasies if somebody gave us, you know, unlimited resources, what we do. And I just like comes to mind, we've got a good friend of our family. She's a designer and every once in a while she'll get these clients and they're like, you do whatever you want. We're good. I kind of get the impression you got a similar blank canvas handed to you. Take me back to that moment where you said, okay, I've got a, I, I, I there's a ton of bells and whistles out here, but I get to de decide what, what we bring in here and, and where to put it. Uh, first, first thought was overwhelming actually. I bet. Um, so I've been around long enough, lucky enough to be involved with a couple different things here. So um, back when Ralph Ingolstead uh, donated $100 million for this facility back around uh, 1998-ish, something like that. Is it that um, old? Or I guess that's yeah. in the donation. But yeah, I mean, it looks like it opened last week. 2000, 2000 2001. Wow. The fall of 2000, I think it was. Maybe it was all one. I can't remember offhand. But so I was lucky enough to be involved with with uh, the lower level at that time. Coach Dean Blaze was was the head coach at the time, and and uh, I had an old old jock job of driving Zamboni, um, working in the athletic training room, work, working in the weight room, uh, some of the mechanical stuff, all that kind of interesting stuff. And and uh, uh, between myself and Coach Sandlin, that's now at, uh, in Duluth, yeah. he was here as assistant at the time, and. Coach Blaze kind of said, all right, you guys just do what you do. You know, check, obviously check on him on important things, but uh, you know what you guys want and how, how things are done. So we went about it in that manner. I learned a lot during that phase of building the whole thing of being involved with that, which was unique. And, and it, it was, I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. So anyway, when, when, uh, um, I, I was brought in the conversation about it's time to upgrade down at the lower level down here again. Um, I was like, okay, so what, what degree are we talking about? And this is coming from general manager here. Um, so Jody, because again, it, Jody Hodgson. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he had mentioned time to upgrade. We want to make sure that, uh, because the lease I believe is up uh, in 2030, I believe. Uh, to where Ingolstadt Corporation run, runs this, and uh, the university is going to take it over. That was that was the initial conversation way back Got thirty it. years ago. Um, but they want to make sure that it's as Ralph would like it, as far as 
the, the best. Yeah. Like everything about it at the time was we make it, we want to make this place like the best in the world. No matter what we do, we want to make it the best. I mean, there's granite, there's leather, all that kind of awesome stuff. But as far as but for the players, granite doesn't here, help you win hockey games, to be fair. Correct. Yeah. So we got it. It brings in the fans. It brings in, uh, it bring, you know what? It, to a small degree, it brings in uh, some athletes. Sure. To, to take fair, a look fair, at the facility yeah. and like, you know what, this place is unbelievable. We pack it every night, great fans, all that kind of stuff. So I think it's part of it. I, I, I do. Um, but with the uh, remodeling part, uh, he'd asked me what I what I would like to do if, if I had the opportunity. And my two things right away I knew were going to be no, but I thought I'd ask anyway. Like, can I get a higher ceiling? as far as I'd like a higher ceiling. And then he goes, can't do it. I said, okay, how about natural light? And he goes, can't do it. I said, okay, then I'm good. I don't need anything else. We're, we're set in here. We have 10,000 square feet. We have a turf floor. We have all the equipment that I really need, really. Can I, can I interrupt you? I'm just, I'm just natural light. Why natural light? It's how, I don't know. Things just... Uh, it has nothing to do with actually working out, but but the mood you have when you have natural light, um, just seeing light out, uh, I don't know, just the feel of, of the weight room. I've been in weight rooms to where, you know, you're at the lower level, even though it's what, probably 16, 18 foot ceiling down here. But, yeah. but still, just to have windows and, and to see the, the sunrise, sunset, whatever you're doing. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm curious about that. Just I've seen a couple, I think like the LA Kings, that was a big thing in their training facility. I've been in there and they had like the doors that open and you can get the natural light. And I, I sense that that, I think I noticed that a lot, especially obviously like in football facilities in the NCAA, that, that, that seems to be, it's not an accident. That's a focus where there's a, whether it's boosting your mood, your energy level, it's a, uh, it's a thing. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. So those are the two things that are an automatic no, which again, I assume that, um, but this was pre-COVID, so we started doing some preliminary type of discussion on what we're thinking about. Do we want to expand to a shooting room? So we're, we already had a shooting area, but not not what we have now. Um, and then he went on a, a little, uh, it had nothing necessarily to do with, with the remodel or the redo of the weight room area. Um, but he had went out to Gonzaga. He went out to three or four different facilities for some other reason. He came back. And I believe he talked with Chris Ingolstead, uh, Ralph's daughter, who's in charge of everything now. Um, and he said, uh, we're, we're going to turn it up. We're, we're going we're to turn up what we're going to do in, in, in the lower level. We're going to make this thing unbelievable. What, so what do, you, what do I think would, would make that facility, wow. uh, you know, unforgettable type? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I uh, from there I just did a lot of research. I probably researched for a year, probably before, I, if not more, trying to figure out uh, new things out there. So I wanted tradition area. I wanted a, a shooting area. I wanted um, a turf area. But then some high tech things, some some analytic possibilities, some things that might be up and coming. Um, the, the problem is it's a little over my head, some of that analytics. Yeah. Um, so I'm a faculty member at the university here at the med school. Um, so I teach there. I'm an athletic trainer by trade. And I wanted the strength coaching maybe 15 years ago. I played football out here a long time ago. Yeah. But So that's kind of my background in it. So it all interests me. But I am definitely a jack of all, master of none. When, when, when it comes to what, what I do here, I mean, I, I know a little bit about a lot of it, but not the specifics. And, and so I'm lucky enough to have somebody on campus here that uh, is all in and, he, and he's an unbelievable resource and he's, he's working with the team with us now too. Got it. it I, I wonder though, like in the industry that you're in, is, is there any masters? Because it just seems like the, the, um, the innovation, the technology, et cetera, is moving so fast that it would yeah. be really tough for anybody to be, you know, have a, a thumb on the pulse of, of everything that's out there. I, I is, is part of the challenge, I guess, and, and not just in, in the remodeling, but just in your day to day job is to maybe push out some of the noise because there's so much information you get access to and, and, and just 
maybe whether it's helping the athlete or perhaps the coaching staff, but say, hey, like out of all the things we could focus on, here's the core things that we're going to focus on. Um, otherwise, it could just be overwhelming. Um, but I think you take that, though, because you need to you need to sift out the things that might actually come into play at some point in time. Um, but the day to day is still pretty similar as, as at any point in time. Uh, the discussions between using catapult to what degree do we utilize that information? Do we apply it? Do we learn from it? Um, but I, I, there, there's many different things here that the analytic part of it, um, I would say the coaches have been great to, to um, not, not adapt, but listen because it's really backing up what they already know. Pretty much everything that we do just kind of backs up. Some things may be like, oh, that's interesting. I, we didn't think of it being that demanding, like mm -hmm. like a game day skate or, or, you know, that type of stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the one thing, there was a, a room that we went into was, I, I think I'm getting this right. It was a um, high altitude training environment. I, I don't know if that's right. the right way to describe it, but yeah. it was effectively... In a layman's term, it was, it was cardio equipment that could be used in an environment where you're, you're training at a high altitude, which, you know, at first I was like, oh, this makes sense because Denver's in your conference and so is CC. However, I sense that there's probably a lot more to it than that, just from, a, you know, the benefits of increasing a players. I don't know if that affects your VO2 max or just your overall cardiovascular. Well, like they can assist. I mean, just, just going a little hypoxic. Yeah. Um, and And... So that, that's probably the largest amount of data trying to figure out the best usage of it. Interesting. Um, so there, there, so it's 1,200 square feet. It has, uh, what, 15 watt bikes in it. It has some uh, Kaiser uh, total body and uh, ellipticals. But also on the other side, there, there's a... Desmotech, which is flywheel training, is it's a company out of Italy that um, I, I've I've used some other type of flywheel training, and these really work well as far as they don't get tangled and stuff. Um, and again, I'm still not utilizing everything I can because it it has feedback right in front of you. As far as each athlete has their own information, and it adapts as they're going, it adapts to to their their peak force each time and we can set that to a certain degree um but we utilize that a lot in the summer the 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 altitude room while strength training with the with the eccentric flywheel training which we got some very good results in with uh with uh the power end of the summer with power and strength um so we utilize it in the summer quite a bit um but the altitude training itself that's where John Fitzgerald, our exercise physiologist, comes comes into play. Um, he's the research guru. He he uh, he tells me things that may work, may not work, things to mess with, things to stay away from. Obviously, you start with you know, does anybody have any physical issues that they should not be at nine thousand feet? Sure. Um, yeah. So it's not pressurized though. It's it's just decreased oxygen basically in in that room. Wow. And you know, when, when you look at, um, what, what are the fundamentals? So let's say you didn't have any bells and whistles at your disposal and, you know, we went back, I don't know, 20 years, um, when you were first sort of, I think taking over the, uh, we'll call it the athlete development portion of the UND program. What are the fundamentals and have any of those changed, um, during your time there? I would say I've always been not a massive fan of Olympic lifts, and I know that's going to cause a lot of issues, but I've never been a massive fan of them, even though they're the basics of everything we do. Um, but I guess in my, in my uh, experience, the technique that you should have to really go heavy and go explosive is kind of paramount as far as preventing injuries. Um, whether you're doing cleans, um, if you're doing, uh, back squats, even bench, I don't do a whole lot of bench anymore either, which I know that sounds, I'm not worried about injury there. I just prefer to get the, 
entire posterior chain and core engaged when you're doing any, any, any pressing. Um, but anyway, um, so way back, I tried to find different ways of being able to load as much as you can without loading the spine. Say we're doing a back squat. Yeah. Um, so when I started, I kind of stopped doing back squats. We did some front squats, but the wrist issues that so many of the guys have, it's not great. What, what yeah. do you use? I'm just, what do you use? If you're not using squats, what would be some other examples of exercises that you were using with for legs? And part of the reason I ask, I know when I was coaching junior hockey and I won't call out any specific programs, but there were some players that went to, um, went to school in the States. I sensed that they had their athletic trainers were, or strength conditioning coaches came from football and they were just piling weight on them. And I mean, there was a couple of kids that like, they, they didn't play much longer after that. And it was all, you know, they were injuries that occurred in the right. weight room and, and they, overload them. So th- th- those are the philosophy issues and, and the concerns uh, with strength and conditioning. And, and, and I, th- it's a different sport. Football is a different sport, even yeah. though the movements in Olympic lifts are basic for every motion that, 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 hockey players do and everybody does i yeah. mean they're basic motions i just i the the small population i get age 18 to 24 i don't know if it's needed for me to teach uh technique if they're going to go that heavy um for those specific things so i load them more so with belt squats isometric belts um single leg squat um we do a lot of single leg uh, squats. And I know it's still squat is still loaded on your spine, but it's quite a bit less weight and your hips are in a little bit better position to, to, to handle that. Because again, a lot of the, a lot of the hip issues in hockey players, they need to get a wider stance anyway, or they'll get a little butt wink, or they'll end up with a little too much lordosis in the lower back, or they don't have enough dorsiflexion in, in their ankles. So there, for me, there's limitations with, with the population I work with to, really go heavy and that might be somewhat of an excuse because i don't like them necessarily not i guess not not that i don't like them but i don't find them as as beneficial as maybe some people would um i know i'll probably catch grief for that but um i would prefer to do a heavy single leg um rather than a heavy back squat for for this population for sure and you know what and that, that makes sense um, and I mean, we see it, I mean, in particular with the skating coaches that we work with, where everything's about posture now, and there's so much emphasis placed on like, um, you know, hip movement. And I, I wonder for, for any, um, for younger players, what can they do to set themselves up from just a, a say a functional movement standpoint, um, before they even get into the weight room, what can they be doing at a young age to sort of. Um, perhaps accelerate or support their development as a hockey player and, and uh, an athlete that's that's a part of this population. So that's a very that's a difficult answer because I think it really depends on the maturity where they're at and the maturity level. Because um, yeah. so many kids want to get in the weight room as quickly as possible. Like in their mind, I think it, that's where they think right. And see, I don't I don't mind. So so the question is, what's what's working out or what's lifting weights? I mean. I mean, really, if you watch kids on the playground running around, they're, they're doing stops and starts. They're doing jump. They're doing plyometrics. If they're, if they're squatting down to, to grab something off, off the ground or playing, I mean, they're, they're down in a deep squat. So, so when my kids were younger, um, I think peewee level, which uh, I don't know how old that is, maybe 12, yeah, 12 13 11, years 12, old. Yeah. So, yeah, summers around there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we would have them do just uh, body weight type exercise. They can do side lunges back and forth, front lunges, isometric squats, running hills. Um, but it was a team oriented thing. It's, it, it was a group thing. They were having fun doing it. So if that's for me, that's kind of part of it too. At that age, it, it's, it, it can't be a grind and, unless they're, unless they're like, these unbelievable athletes that they have that focus at that age and they're that driven, but that I also mean, few do. I, I feel like even, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. But like my working out with like-minded kids, once they get about 13, 14, 15 year olds, yeah. year old, I think that's uh, the idea of having like-minded kids that um, 
want to push each other. I think that's that, that's a great situation. But but as far as specific lifts, I think that's really dependent on how far they are as far as maturity level, when to start adding weights. Again, you're not going to really put on any mass until you get some testosterone, but you can work on, there's a lot of other things you can work on, balance, proprioception. Yeah. Um, you can get stronger. You're just not going to, the muscles aren't going to get a whole lot bigger until they get that testosterone. Well, I, I, it's, it's funny. Like, I think that's one thing that's changed in our game. Like if you watch um, games today versus 20 years ago, you can certainly see um, a difference in the speed, the puck movement. Like it, it looks different. The other thing that looks different is when you see hockey players today in playing clothes is they don't look like, they certainly don't look like the body types that when I was playing that we were told that we should aspire to look like. Um, yeah. Just in terms of they're a lot leaner and longer. And, um, it, it, but back in the day, they were leaner and longer. Today, they seem leaner and longer. I think they got bigger thighs and butts. <laughs> okay, that that could be maybe an emphasis. So, because I, I mean, it's funny you mentioned bench press because I think as a as a kid, and I think probably like I'm, um, you know, my early forties now. But I think like that was the thing that you did. Like that was if you could do one exercise, you got you went and did bench press, and everybody yep. you know was paying attention to that. Where again, I think today, like, um, you know, I don't know how how on the radar it is for a lot of aspiring players, just because I think the education they're just you know. I mean, shoot, kids have trainers at 13 now. Um, oh, I know, right? right. And there's nothing that I, I, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that at all. I guess I, I'm looking at our local small town that not only Grand Forks, we grew up in East Grand Forks, but there's such a, I think there's a difference. I don't know. These kids grow up together the whole time. They play on the same team all the way. Most yeah. of them do all the way through grade 12. Yeah. And it's such, it, 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 it's so, it's all about your friends. I, I, I would bet half the players don't, the only reason they play hockey is, is because that's what they do around their buddies. And yeah. if you excel, you excel, you know, so it's interesting. Yeah. Well, it's a different model. And I, you know, I, I think what's great is that, you know, we're, we're going to have coaches that are listening to this that are coaching, say, in the BCHL or USHL. We're going to have some coaches that coach pro, but we're going to have a lot of coaches that coach um, grassroots hockey that are volunteers and they don't have a lot at their disposal. But I would think the only thing that can trump um, the motivation that comes from walking into the UND um, training facility is walking into an environment where you've got your buddies, you've got that friendship, you've got the camaraderie. Like, I don't think anything competes with that. Like, I mean, and I think in that environment, kids will find a way to push each other and you know the old adage iron sharpens iron and you can't you know no no technology can compete with that at least i don't think yeah so when you have both it's great so we we yeah. did have uh, a hockey academy here which is kind of defunct now to a certain degree but yeah when coach barry uh came back before was this his coach here um or in between i can't remember uh we started the hockey academy in in the facility with jody hodgson and and coach barry ran the uh the on ice stuff i ran the off ice stuff and we had some young kids that were like-minded they worked real hard and we ended up probably having eight ten of those local kids uh play for us wow really? and have played well there's probably six of them played in the nhl which is, i mean from this community that that's because that, that's pretty good oh that's a bop like if i'm if I recall, it's about 40,000, 45,000 yeah, be, people. Between Grand Forks and East Grand Forks is probably around 50-ish, I'm guessing, right around yeah, there. Yeah, so that's, that's significant. That's unreal. But they were like-minded kids. They they had their goals. They had fun together. They competed against each other. And, and uh, that, that would, for me, that's one of the neater aspects of, of what we did back then was these kids kept on working and working and working and loving what they were doing. And... Uh, most all of them are still playing, whether it's NHL, AHL, overseas, wherever. So it's pretty neat. That is cool. And how did you, so, well, first off, we'll get into your background, but I understand you grew up on a farm. Yeah. And for everybody that I know that grew up on a farm, there would appear to be um, um, uh, a sense of like, that's 
what you're going to inherit that. Like that's a family business that you, you know, you don't, it's pretty tough to walk away from that for one, but it, um, I, I would think that probably just in terms of the work ethic, the commitment, like how many parallels are there from working on a farm um, to, you know, maybe some of the lessons that, that you're trying to, or the, the, the environment that you're trying to create um, with the hockey program at UND? I, I don't necessarily know if that's transferred to the, to the athletes, but in my, my own mind, just, just knowing that, you know, it, 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 it's a long haul. It, 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 yeah. nothing, it doesn't come right away. Patience. So, so it, it, it's shocking. Some guys don't have to work that hard and they're so talented and they just keep going because they're that talented. But other, most of the people, they just, you know what, they got to keep grinding, find their weakness. What, what are the limitations? Why are they not getting the minutes they want or the power play time they want or what PK they want or whatever? Um, finding their limitations, what their, what's their weak spot? Is it nutrition? Is it is it is it strength? Is it skill? Is it what is it? And, and attack that and get after that. And and I don't know. I guess that maybe you could associate that to growing up on the farm to where, you know, what's preventing from a better yield? What what's you know what can I do to better uh, my situation or family situation? Yeah. Well, and I, I would think too, and I I. I... I don't want anybody to confuse me with uh, being a farmer here because that's definitely not my skill set. But what I either. Yeah. But what I do appreciate is that, you know, no. And I played hockey with a lot of guys that, have, you know, once they finished playing, that's they went back to the family business. And what I appreciate is that, you know, no season is is, is like the other, meaning that every day you're, you're kind of going about your daily routine. It's very much rinse and repeat. But there's going to be new challenges. And when those challenges come, it's not like you just got to deal with it. And you have to solve problems, and and um, and I imagine that's very much like it's very much like grooming a hockey team. Like you know, um, you know, some of the characters might be the same in the locker room, but every player you got to kind of nurture their own, as you said, their individual weaknesses, and you got to find a way to bring them together to be you know greater than the sum of their parts. It's all about response. How do you respond to something? Again, when yeah. you're farming, it's about weather, things you can't control. There's some things you can't control, but how do you respond to the things you can't control? Is it gonna get you going? Is it going to knock you down? How many times does it knock you down before you're, you know, respond in the way that, uh, that works for you? So with, with all that being said, how did you, so we've got your, you were, you know, you grew up on a farm, you come to you and you play football receiver. Yep. Yeah. Yep. A long time ago. Um, how did you go from like, w- w- was the, call it the, I guess the, the sports science, was that an aspiration that you had when you, when you came on campus or was that something that maybe evolved, um, during your time as a student athlete? I came on campus to play football. I was going back to the farm. Uh, no way. Okay. Oh, I broke my thumb and, and I got interested actually in the medical side because I went to prosthetics orthotics and they, they, they they made a a cast for my hand and I got into anatomy. I'm like, Oh, that's kind of neat. So that kind of brought me down the, the medical side of it. But yeah, I had, I started out 2.0, 2.0, 225. I I was not a student athlete. I was just there to play, to play football. So you don't have your like report cards framed in your office or at least the first (laughs) couple of years. Oh, I built it back up. I I did. Okay. Once, once, once I got an interest, I did all right. But yeah, Yeah. that that's yeah. So yeah, I came here to play football and and it just so happened. uh, Shoot. Probably before my junior year, sophomore, I can't remember what year it was. Um, there, There were some battles going on. Um, between hockey and football at the time, like on campus, uh, on campus or at nights, I should say. Okay, all right, uh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a little, a little bit of this. Yeah, and uh, at the time, Gino Gasparini was he was the head hockey coach. Yeah, and the and the AD of of uh, our athletic department, and uh, he came over to the head coach football and mentioned, "Hey, I need a couple milk drinkers over here." What's a milk drinker? Uh, not a whiskey drinker. So somebody that's going to oh, okay, calm gotcha, things down. Gotcha. Okay, so we, clear, we don't yeah. want to bring over the guys that are like stir the pot. We need guys that are going to be just chill. So Love that. Uh, myself and the quarterback went over there, and we started driving Zamboni. Shoot, I drove Zamboni. I still drive Zamboni from time to time. So uh, we got there, and, and things, I don't know if they smoothed out or not. At night, so I have no idea about that, but I enjoyed it. Uh, I got to know Coach Blaze really well, Dean Blaze. Was he the assistant coach at that time? He was the assistant coach yeah. at that time. Yeah, okay. yeah. 
Uh, terrible pinnacle player. I hope that gets to him, by the way. Um, <laughs> so uh, we had a good time. Uh, after that, I went down to Iowa, worked a couple of years for an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. David Field, uh, which I believe actually was on a world junior team for a Team Canada back in the 60s, maybe. Wow. Anyway, so yeah, so then uh, uh, opportunity came up for me to come back and get my master's, master's degree and work with the hockey program. Um, and I took that and uh, just enjoyed it. it it's, it's been so much fun. It really has. Well, I, I got to go back to your football playing days. So when I was down there, we had a chance to go watch UND play uh, North Dakota State. Oh, yeah. Big rivalry yeah. game. Stadium was packed, but it, it's an indoor stadium. And literally, so the hotel we are staying at is, is it's attached to the football stadium. The Alaris, yeah. Yeah. So we're we're from the soft part of Canada. We're from the West Coast. We don't get a lot of snow here. The walk <laughs> from the like the entrance to the hotel to the entrance of the football stadium was five minutes max. Like I was sprinting the last hundred meters to get inside. It was so cold. When you played, was it a dome stadium or did you play outside? No, no, no. It was outside. Come on. It was outside. Oh, yeah. dear God. So and it, I don't think it was that game. It may have been a game. My fresh, no, sophomore year. I can't remember. There was a time where we had some freezing rain. And this is like normal turf. Freezing rain. Snowed on top of it. And that was midweek. And uh, they usually they just use... Um, tractors or, or plows to, to get the snow off, but there was ice, like ice, ice. And I don't know how or why we played the game, but they were guys that I would say probably two thirds of the whole football field was covered in ice, not snow, but ice. So there were guys that I know that put tacks, like thumbtacks through the bottom of their shoes to play. It was hindsight is like what what were we thinking but yeah so yeah we played outside and yeah i i have frozen fingers from it uh, there's yeah th it was i can just about I, guaranteed i would have had a pulled hamstring that week yeah <laughs> yeah yeah no there was it, it it was fun back then yeah yeah you, you know um i i sort of got turned on to this um i i'm a big Alabama football fan. And so when, when Nick Saban took over that program, he installed Scott Cochran as a strength and conditioning coach. And he kind of developed a little bit of, he was a bit of a celebrity at a kind of this Louisiana growl voice. And, and he's, he's with the um, university of Georgia now, but he was clearly a huge part of not just the program, but I think specifically the culture of the program. And I remember there was an interview once with Nick Saban. He said, you know, like, you know, in, in a given week, I get a, a finite amount of time in front of each individual player, but they're in front of Scott all the time. And they're, he's the he's the person that, he, that they're going to come to with their problems. He's going to he's the one when they break up with their girlfriend, he's probably going to go to them first. And I need to trust that the culture that I'm trying to build as the head coach, that it's going to be supported within those those interactions and conversations. How much of your role goes beyond you know, the lifting and, and, and the physical development and just, you know, not only, I guess, to the individual development, but the overall, the team and program development uh, at UND. I don't think it's above and beyond. I think that's all part of it. I think yeah. that's what makes you effective, whether it's in the weight room or the athletic training room um, or walking down the hall, grabbing a bite to eat. Um, I, again, I feel very fortunate knowing all these young men that go through here knowing their how they handle injuries how they handle disappointment how they interact with people it, it as far as the culture side though um working with coach blaze coach hackstall and coach barry they, they set the tone they set the tone they they, they kind of set the the parameters of this is who we are and you know it it seems natural just to follow suit because it, it nothing that they would expect or or, or want is is out of the out of the norm. I mean, you, you want respect, you want humility, you you want people to work hard and care for their teammate. Yeah. And the head coaches do it, the assistant coaches do it. Everybody part of the program does that. They want what's best for the individual. Sometimes the individual wants more for themselves. You would want that, but there's always some conflict where they want more ice time. They think they deserve more. 
but that's that that's that discussion of trust that yes we want what's best for you but the, again the culture of the team is is we want to win yes it's about you being the best you can be moving up the ladder playing wherever you want to play after but there are steps along the way but the culture side of it i i think the it just trickles down from the head coach um i don't sure. know if i do anything more or less than anybody else um i yeah i know a lot of fun. i i could never write a book <laughs> i know way too much about individuals yeah uh but that's what makes it fun that's i mean i i'm almost 60 now and i feel when I'm at work here, I feel like I'm in my 20s because I still get all the stories. I still get all the, the yeah, ups and the downs yeah. of what's going on in their life. Um, it, it's, you know, the funnest part, almost my, my favorite part is talking to parents no about way. how much fun it is to work with their son, like the quality of pe- people that they raised. That, to me, that's the funnest part, talking to the parents and how, how neat that is for them. Well, it was uh, when we were down there. It was, um, I believe, it was Parents Weekend, and they and they brought the parents out. And I, I just had a a moment, and I got I got two boys, and I was like, gosh, like I mean, there's a, our kids could all go off to do a, a zillion different things, but I'm like, if this was one of the things they did, like what a what a cool accomplishment. And I'm sure it goes without saying, if you are fortunate enough to play for a program like UND. Um, it takes a village. Like it's, it's a product of, you know, being really fortunate to have the right parents, you know, the level of commitment that, that it takes from them just to get you through hockey, the amount of coaches you've had, um, and that the, you know, the athlete or person that, that you get to work with as a product of, you know, just being around a lot of the right people. Um, right. You know, and, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, that's also a stressor on, I mean, there, there's a lot of, and that's not just here. It's every place you go to, to continue to play. But there's a lot of expectations when you when, when you make it uh, make it here, and not not only from themselves, their parents, their agents, their teams, the community, their teammates. Just there, there's there's some pressures there, and 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 that's for me actually that's my one of the, one of the bigger changes I think I've seen over the years with the athlete. Maybe not the athlete themselves. Yeah, but but the expectations. How much, how much of that can be traced back to the internet, whether it's just, you know, the ranking systems, it's, you know, social media. I mean, any of these players, any, any fan, anybody can get to them on their phone um, if they're willing to pay attention. Um, And, and just, I mean, I think for the players now, like, gosh, if they, you know, with the amount of blogs and everything, like any of these kids, that's a prospect of an NHL team. They're probably being talked about, after nearly every weekend the, the the first time i kind of recognized pressure yeah and he handled it unbelievable was zach parisi wow, just okay yeah. the, the amount of i mean on sports illustrated back at that time i mean that i don't even remember what years he was here probably early 2000s one yeah. two three summers around there um that's kind of the first time that i i recognize and again it's not that he ever it ever weighed him down but just the awareness that, that he had to have and day to day, just knowing that he had to be careful to a certain degree of what he said, what he did. Yeah. And then moving on from there between Oshi and Taves and, 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 uh, I don't know. I, I don't like to name names, but all these guys that go through here, it's just getting harder and harder for them to be themselves. I bet. Yeah. It is a bit of a, I I guess you never really think of that. I I think we all look at that and we think, oh my God, that must be amazing to be in that environment. But there's a, there's another side to that where these, these kids probably, as you said, they, um, you know, the times where they can just let loose and be kids. And by let loose, I don't mean go off the rails. I mean, just hang out and be one of the boys is probably few and far between when they're on campus. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What, I mean, I mean, you just rattle off a bunch of names and I mean, I, I mean, the, the amount of players that have, um, that are household names today that have come through there is long. And I mean, it's interesting. You, you, you mentioned Zach Parise. I mean, Zach's, he's coaching now. I mean, he's, he's, he's not playing anymore. So all these players, I mean, they all have different skill sets. They, they play different roles. What was maybe a commonality just in terms of their mindset and approach that, that you could you know, reflect on with, with the benefit of hindsight now? There'd be one or two outliers, but I, I think 
just the the focus, the day to day focus of knowing why they were doing something. Yeah, I I, I think that's probably the big. They they all worked hard in their own way, um, but the intentional intentionality of what they were doing and how that was going to make them better, I think motivated them rather than just going out there and doing things. Yeah. There was a reason why they did this drill and or that lift or that preparation or that recovery or whatever. That that's interesting. And, and I know um, a good buddy of mine, Glenn Carnegie, he was the development coach of the Canucks for a long time, but from Winnipeg, had known Jonathan Taze, for example, since he was worked with him since he was a kid and continues to work with him in the off season. But I think that was one thing he always said. He, Cause I'd ask him like, what made Jonathan special? He's like, you know, every summer he didn't try and get better at everything, but he'd identify two to three things and then become obsessive about getting better in those two to three things. And, and to your point, it wasn't just about saying, I'm going to get a better shot. Like he would lay out the plan get the information, get the details, and then make sure every day that he woke up, it wasn't, he wasn't rolling the dice. He knew exactly where his output had to be directed to try and get better in those areas. And I like how much of that is you providing them information and how much of that is just the players being, you know, intrinsically motivated and, and finding out themselves. To a certain degree, it's intrinsically motivated. Um, there's a lot of different things I introduce to them. I never really make them do a whole, I don't make them, you have to do this, this, or this, or this necessarily. It's introducing them to different things and what works for them. Um, but actually, Johnny is the one I'm thinking of more than anybody, even though there's, there's plenty of other ones, as, as far as just focused. Yeah. He's just focused on what he needed to do. Great kid, awesome worker. Um, but yeah, uh, very similar along with uh, Breezy as far as, in my mind anyway, just needing just the awareness of um, not being careful, but knowing who he is, where he's at yeah. and um, just the pressures. It, it, just, just hearing you say that, w w would it be fair? And I know, you know, you know, there's the book good to great, for example, um, which talks about the difference between a good company and a great company. Is there maybe something to be said as well for saying like, you know, good players work hard, but focus is what turns good to great as a player. And, and you know, there's a distinction between working. Anybody can work hard, but working hard and, and having the ability to focus and do it consistently. Is is that one of the, you know, what separates I, I, the, the, the. Yeah, group? I would think so. And actually, I was going to add to that, too. Is it, So. And again, I may get in trouble through USA hockey, but I've had some handful of young men come down here that, that have been involved with Hockey Canada that have their stuff together. Like they know what they're doing, why they're doing it, and they repeat that over and over again. They know what works for them. They, they know between warming up, lifts, cooling down, hydration, nutrition, the whole ball of wax. I, I've had some players that I don't want to say robotic, but they, they, they have their routine and they know why they're doing it. Um, and there's other young men that come in here too, but as a general rule, I, I've, I've seen that through uh, half a dozen or so Hockey Canada kids that have come down here that, that have played with us uh, yeah. at the university here, and uh, they have that that focus, that, that drive to pick something out and focus on, 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 that, yeah, not, on that aspect. That's interesting. That's interesting. This is a, a little bit of a selfish question. But of all the things that influence performance, so I'm, I'm 43 years old and, um, um, do, do you know, Mark Fitzgerald he used to be with the ducks, um, or the Leafs. So he's uh, he works with the OHA Academy now, but he was strength and conditioning coach for the ducks. He's a pal. And I can remember this is going back three, four years ago. They're in town. We go for dinner in Vancouver and, um, you know, kind of, he's like, Hey, you're, you know, you're looking a little puffy there. And I'm like, easy there, big guy. I said, I, I, I I'm going to work, I'm going to work really hard these next couple months. And I'm going to, I'm going to get back on track. He's like, it's going to take you two years. And I was like, two years, what are you talking about? I can turn this ship around. No problem. He's like, no, man. He's like, you're almost 40 now. Like things are changing. It's going to, you're going to go like this. And he's like, you'll take some step. You'll take three steps forward, two back, 
three forward, two back, et cetera. You know, you got kids, you got, there's a whole bunch of other influences now, but you know, so he, and he was right. He was absolutely right. That's how it's kind of gone. And it's still a work in progress, but I bring this up because what I've come to appreciate is that, you know, when I was growing up as a player, you know, you know, refueling or recharging that would, that was getting a couple of pizzas in the, the locker room after the game. And, um, you know, n- now, like, I just look at, like, I case in point, we were down in North Dakota and we watched all your players leave the rink, um, after the pregame skate, every one of them had a little container of food, you know, so they're paying attention to what they're eating. And I'm assuming that you guys, I believe have a chef on staff that prepares those meals for them. But I, I look at that because for me personally, like, I can do all the exercise I want. If I don't get good sleep and I don't put the right food in my body, the rest doesn't really matter. Um, You know, going back to those fundamentals, how important when you're looking at the individual player and they're coming like, how important is paying attention to the things that maybe a lot of people wouldn't assume needs to be a point of focus, i.e. nutrition, i.e. sleep, and and maybe some other things that, um, you know, we, we don't necessarily you know, appreciate when it comes to athlete development. Uh, I agree a hundred percent. Genetics would be one. Uh, Sleep and nutrition. Uh, Hydration as as well after exercise. Yeah, it's interesting. Hydration, yeah. Yeah, but nutrition is so tough for guys to follow up on and to do it the right to do it the right way. I mean, who doesn't want? something that's uh, with it, whether you have a sweet tooth or greasy or what, what did you feel like having? <laughs> yeah. It, no, it, I'm going to have a salad. I salad. Yeah. So I think that's difficult. I think as, as we get a little bit older, we, we may uh, focus on that a bit more, but sometimes it is just about calories replacing the calories. Yeah. Uh, but the, the other thing for me, the, the, as important, if not more is, is sleep. I mean, that affects every major system in your body between your immune system, your energy system, just everything has to do with quality sleep. So um, being able to do that is probably something we focus on a bit more uh, in the last five years or so. How do you focus on that? Other th- other than to say, you know, get to bed, what would be some of the, the hacks? What are some sleeping hacks here? Um, so we have our sports psychologists come in and mm. The initial talk every year is how to sleep better. Got it. So that usually open opens the doors to where some of the guys are like, well, you know what? Sometimes I have a problem falling asleep Friday after a game, which makes total sense. You you eat late, you're out of routine, you're ruminating about the game. I don't get sleep until three, four, or five in the morning sometimes because I'm I'm just so into it. Well, you know, you may have had coffee before the game. Okay, so that that also adds to it. So there's a lot of things that start that conversation with a sports psychologist because of the, the sleep talk. Um, and then it ends up getting into, okay, well, why do you worry about things that are done? You know, then, then the anxiety part comes into it. So how do you handle anxiety? How do you handle pressures? How do you handle all that? And it kind of morphs to a certain degree about sleep post exercise to how do you handle life? How do you handle school? How do you handle relationship? It, yeah, it, it's all kind of one. It's not just sports psychology. It, it kind of so works. Into, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, the, the sleep aspect of it. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I don't mean to drop uh, names or whatever, but although I guess I have already guys played here, but uh, uh, we do have whoop bands available for the guys. Yeah. We got a couple so, of our staff that are on those and they, they swear so they, by them. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as using for research, probably, probably not so much, but it, it gives you a heart rate variability, resting heart rate, respiratory rate, skin temperature, your energy that, that, that you've expended, your sleep score. Um, and they're all, we just look at trends, tell the guys, look at trends, but the best part of it is the journal. So they can, Uh, I I have them, you know, make sure you do these 10 to 12 different, every morning you answer what you did, you have questions and you answer what you did the day before. And do you use an actual journal or do you use an app? It's part of the whoop whoop app. Got it. Okay. Right. So as as far as did did you have an alcohol last night? Uh, Did you take take a nap? Did you 
um, eat late? Did you, uh, th there's 60, 70 different questions having to do with your routine. And then after the longer you do it, the more of a trend you see as far as, you know, when I, when I have a glass of wine, I sleep really good. When I have three, I don't. When I, uh, Interesting. when I take, when I take a 15 minute cat nap, you know, throughout the day, I can sleep that night. But if it, if it's later in the afternoon, again, these are common sense things, a lot of them. Sure. But, uh, sleep in a hotel room rather than home. I mean, all these things either add to your sleep quality or yeah. they detract from it. And for them just to recognize, and again, a lot of it is, well, no kidding. If I do that, obviously I'm not going to sleep well. But well, like anything else, like those reminders, I'm sure help. And I mean, yeah. I mean, for anybody that's been a, I mean, take the student, the, the athlete out of the student athlete part, but just being a, a student on campus, like um, campus lifestyle maybe isn't designed to be super conducive to sleep in most right, scenarios. Right. So, yeah. So it, so the analytics to come out of here for me is very similar to, so they, they, they kind of boost or objectify the, or gives, give objective data to what they think, kind of like catapult or some other analytics kind of justify or tell the coaches what they already kind of think as well. So that's one of the neat things for for sleep is they can monitor it. Now, the downside to it, it might not be best for all the athletes because some of them want to control it more than what they can. So like they get irritated, like there's no way that, that my heart rate variability is it's better. I felt great. Yeah. Like my, my sleep score should be so much higher than that. And then they start messing around with it. So then I, I take it away from them. So. Got it. Got it. What, what I want to dive in. I mean, you've, you've mentioned a few names here. You've had the fortune of working with some just world-class coaches um, at the program, but on the, you know, the physical development side, and I, and I bring this up partly like we did a, an event with Bruce Cassidy um, a couple weeks ago and, you know, Bruce is almost 60 and I'm sitting there beside him chatting with him. I'm like, the guy is like, I don't know if he could play today, but he's not far off. And a lot of these, like Dave Haxtell, another guy, Dave Haxtell's jacked. Um, no, no, he's not. He's not? <laughs> I'm okay. I, again, I'm hoping he's going to hear this. this so, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you got. Yeah, he's going to be running hills all summer because I believe he goes back there um, in the off season. But I look at these guys like the, the, as much as we talk that the you know the game looks different today, the players look different today, the coaches look different today, and as much as you talk about the stressors that are on the athletes, I, I would argue the stressors on the coaches are, are, are amplified significantly as well. I mean, he's being a head coach in the NHL now. I mean, you're in front of a camera on a daily basis, um, the, the number of media outlets, et cetera. If you were running a hockey coaches boot camp and, and setting and setting coaches up, pardon me, for success, um, what would be some of the fundamentals to say, hey, you know, guys and girls, you got to focus on these areas or this is how you can maybe, you know, you can just be a better leader overall in terms of the decisions you make, how you show up, mindset, et cetera, all those things. What would be some of the, the key things that you would encourage coaches to pay attention to? Wow. We should maybe set up a coach's boot camp in the summer down there. That would be awesome. I would say sports psychology. Yeah. <laughs> that, how, to, how to handle the pressure. Uh, and and I, I didn't hear Dave Haxall say this. Somebody had told me he, he had – said this when he came back the one time that he felt more, I don't want to say pressure necessarily, but um, concern when he coached, there was more pressure on him coaching here really? than anyplace else he's, he's coached. And again, I didn't hear that firsthand. That was hearsay, but yeah, um, just the expectations from the fans, it's, it's like playing in a Canadian type of, uh, area region. See, I, I would compare, would you not compare it to like the pressure at UND with the hockey program is probably equivalent to what the major football schools are under in the States. Yeah. 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 So again, just, just the microscope they're under the expectations to, to win by the fans and the administration and, and the, cause again, if, if this 11,000 seat arena all of a sudden, we get 2000 that affects the entire community financially. Yeah. I you know, as as far as, wow. and the athletic department d depends on, on hockey. Again, it's not the one and only, but there's a lot of pressure for the head coach. Um, and I, 
if anything, that's what I, I feel that the most for them. Everyone that's been here, the three that I've worked with, I, I empathize with their, their, their plight. And, and again, they pick it, they love it. They absolutely love it. Yeah. But there, there's, there's a, there's stress is there. So for me, the boot camp would be all about how to take care of yourself mentally. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Noted. And I'd be curious too, like if you were just to give some general advice, you know how busy coaches are. If they had 60 minutes in a day um, and that could be spent on a treadmill, it could be spent reading a book on sports psychology. What would be some things where you would say, hey guys, just like, just try and get this in on a daily basis. This is going to just sort of help your overall performance. Yeah. I, I would say a routine, get up early in the morning. Yeah. Get up early in the morning. Just find me, me time. Just hop on a bike, hop on an elliptical, whatever exercise you you like to do. Yeah, do that. Phones no place near you. Yeah, whatever you want to listen to or not listen to, just find time for yourself. And if you're thinking about hockey, find something else to do. Love that. Think about your family. Think about everything else. That would be my. I, again, I'm, I'm guessing all three of them that I work for is going to come back and tell me that I'm full of crap. No, but. Mark, I think, man, I'll tell you what, I think we're on to something here with this coach's boot camp. I think this is, uh, this is, <laughs> this is needed, man. This is needed. Um, just again, sticking with the coaches that you've worked with, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, Dwayne Blaze, like Dave Haxtell, um, Brad Barry. Let's check this out. This guy, best moving here <laughs> ever. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, I think what's great is that, again, this is this is my perception. Um, the, the program there has been remarkably consistent, remarkably competitive. Um, but under the leadership of three very different personalities, is that is that fair? I think. Yeah, I, I, I guess. I mean, Dean was just out there. He. He, he has an ability. He's an intimidating man. Oh, he can be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Teddy, Teddy Bear playing pinnacle, but he's yeah, he's he, 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 he uh, yeah, he, he has that tooth when he, he that silver yeah. tooth that uh, yeah, you can tell when it's time to back off and let him uh, sure. let him be him. Uh, but he has an awesome connection with with the staff and 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 the players. Like the ability that you didn't want to let him down, and I think that's players. I think that's staff. Um, I mean, he salt of the earth. I mean, he, he, he'd take care of, I, he's, he gave his truck to somebody who needed a truck, not a player, but a, a maintenance person and said, Hey, if, if you can pay me down the road, just pay me down the road. Cool. I mean, he, wow. he, just one of the nicest guys. Yeah. You, you know, I, that's a story probably shouldn't have got out, but he, he's just such a quality person. Um, but the players love to play for him. He he played the, not not emotion, but but it was either he was in your face, or it was more so great job. You know, love it. I mean, the, he was part of the part of the guys as far as their their emotional side too. Yeah. Um, Dave Haxall, intimidating in his own right. He has that stare. He has that look about him. Um, He is so much more personal than anybody, not anybody, but the one mo most people thinks he's very rigid. He's yeah. not at all. That would be he's my, that would be my take. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And again, such a quality person. Same thing. Uh, Warburg, Warburg, Alberta. Yeah. That yeah. small town. Yeah. He has that personality of a small town farm kid as well. Uh, work ethic like nobody. Um, extremely happy for him. Uh, for for the success he's had, um, but yeah, he he was a lot more business like. And again, I think he he should be able to be a CEO any place. The, the way he's able to focus on this and then that. Yeah, that, I, I was gonna say like he he strikes me as somebody that could have been a CEO. He could have been an army general. Like he could have just been somebody that seems to yeah could thrive in high stakes yeah. situations. I mean, there, yeah, there. I mean, there could be a, a an extremely intense conversation one second somebody comes in the door and that's that shut and now i'm focused on on whatever just came in through the door he was so good at that and then coach berry is kind of a combination of, of both of them really 
Mm-hmm. He, he's a player's coach as far as he loves to be with the guys. Um, and yet, as an assistant, he was really like a player's coach. But now with the head position, I think that's a little bit more difficult to be a player's coach. But he's so good at it, too. That like, like the guys respond. Uh, the staff, again, very similar. Uh, just you don't want to let them down because he's just such a quality person, full of humility, um, just wants the best for, for everybody. And I've been no, so he's fortunate a good dude. to work with those three guys. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So fortunate to have those three men that uh, that uh, I've been able to learn from and be around. Well, I, you know, I think what's, I mean, you've had this remarkable career. And I, I always say this, I think some of the best conversations that we have on the show and just through our work at the coaches site is, you know, the, the nature of sport is that, you you know, you bounce around. Um, and there's, there's a benefit to that because you get exposed to different things. You, you know, I think, you know, you, you grow in different ways. Um, but there's this, there's this other side of it. When you, when we talk to people in sport that have been in one place and have been able to really have the benefit of watching something grow, to be there from watching, you know, young people grow into, in, into men or women and, and, you know, be just, you know, not just be, um, a, a placeholder, in their athletic life, but to be a, a pillar in their, in their overall life development. Um, and you've certainly had that there. When, when you look at, um, I, again, you guys are, you're down there working with athletes that are going to be playing on TV uh, in the not too distant future. Um, and it, you know, UND's become a real hockey factory. But for all the coaches that are out there trying to develop programs, or it's not so much about playing on TV one day, it's just about being, you know, leveraging sport to impact the quality of your life moving forward. What might be um, some of the advice that you would lend them and just in terms of how they create uh, an environment that, that supports that. Oof. So I'm the strength coach, athletic trainer. I'm not, I'm not the hockey coach, but in yeah. saying that uh, I think always having the, the, the team, the most important thing for the team in your mind, but making it about the individual yeah at making sure the individual feels that this is where you fit in this is i want the best for you is, is, is i think as long as the as long as the athlete understands that you're not just part of the team you're not just here to progress we care about you we, we care about not only hockey but what's going on at home what's happening in life how's school going uh just getting to know them i think is probably the best way to to build what you want to build as far as a culture. No, knowing that, yes, hockey is important. Yes, everything is important. We want you to, to succeed, but how are you doing? Love that. Love that. Mark, I, I feel like we just scraped the surface. I th- we're going to have to find a way to get you back on the show or perhaps get you on stage at our conference because um, I think you got a, a lot of, of great insights here and probably more than you give yourself credit for. But um know how busy this season is thanks so much for for making time to join us today and, and sharing a bit about uh, your own coaching journey all right it's very nice to meet you the, uh, what is a month two months ago whatever very yeah. nice talk to you thank you much appreciate it